We've been taught that what we have in the Bible is the Word of God. We've been taught that it's inerrant in its original manuscripts. I thought, what good does that do? We don't have the original manuscripts. And I don't know what inerrant means anyway. But this is the interesting part. It's true. And we're going to find out how that could be. Because Christianity is a religion based on history and not on myth, not on fiction and stories made up. Now, that's a big old statement. If Christianity doesn't prove to be historically accurate, how can you believe anything it says? Anything it says. Okay, today we're not really going to talk about religion, and I'm not going to preach from the Bible. We're just going to talk about what the Bible is, where it came from. How can we at least decide that it's probably accurate? So, to start with, the Bible is unique. I don't think there's any other book like it in the, on the planet. 66 books, or documents, you could say, written by 40 authors in many countries over a period of around 1,600 years. It's this collection, this anthology. And it was probably begun something like 4,000 years ago. We don't really know. And this book has been considered sacred from the very first writing 4,000 years ago. Interesting. We're following very ancient tradition when we read the Bible. There are tens of thousands of ancient manuscripts of it in various forms in places throughout the world. A lot of schools and museums and libraries. And I suppose private collections as well. There's some variation in these manuscripts. In fact, there's quite a lot of variation in these manuscripts and that's one of the kind of worrisome things. How do you know which is the right one? We're going to find out. But fortunately, even so, the details are minor and they don't affect the truth of our faith. They don't affect doctrine. These little changes are kind of like spelling and punctuation and those kind of differences. But there are some more major differences, but most of them are like that. The collection of documents that we have is called the Canon of Scripture. It's spelled like this, not like a boom. The canon means the rule of faith or a standard. It's like a ruler. It's how we measure whether something is right or wrong, whether it's from God or not. That's the canon. It uh, came from uh, scripture in Peter where he talked about this is the rule. So that was the word canon. Okay, first we're going to look at the New Test, the Old Testament, where that came from, and then we're going to look at where the New Testament came from. So we're going to look at the Old Testament. The Old Testament was accepted by the people of Israel as the Word of God right from the get-go. It was by prophets of God or about prophets of God. It was written and edited and compiled by Israel throughout many generations. And as they were written, they were accepted immediately because they were by a prophet. Moses wrote the first five, five books according to tradition, but as you read uh, Genesis, you realize that it had some editors writing into it later 
and especially at the end of Moses' life, it said that it talks about him after he died. So Moses couldn't have written that. And it says things like it happened even to this day, and it has things like that. So as you read it, you can see that there's been some additions besides what Moses wrote. But it was accepted by Israelites in Moses' day, what he wrote, and you can see that in Exodus 24.3 and Joshua 1.8, if you want. We won't be looking them up, otherwise we'll be here forever. Joshua was added to what Moses wrote, and his work was accepted immediately. You can see that in Joshua 24.26. Daniel accepted Jeremiah's book right away. He said he had a copy of it, and he said it was from the Lord. You can see that in Daniel 9.2. These uh, accepted books were very carefully copied. And this is why we can trust them as being the same as the originals. They were preserved generation after generation. In Deuteronomy 31:26, we see that Moses' books were kept right beside the Ark of the Covenant. And I, I believe that the Ten Commandments were actually in the ark. 1 Samuel 10.25 says, Moses placed a book of the ordinances before the Lord in the, temp, in the uh, ark of I mean, in the tabernacle. Daniel, it says, has a collection of these books. In Josiah's day, the, the books had all disappeared. People completely forgot about them. And they were discovered during King Josiah's reign. And in 2 Kings 23, 24 to 25, and Proverbs 25, 1, it identifies the Proverbs of Solomon that Hezekiah wrote down. And in Ezra 7, 6, we learn that Ezra kept a copy of the books while they were in exile in Babylon and brought them back with him when they came back to Palestine. And then he read them to the people and explained them. And they had apparently not heard them before. But this is another interesting thing. Not every book that's written in Hebrew was accepted as the word of God. Some were not immediately accepted, that were eventually accepted. Um, they went through a process of debate. Uh, the ones that you might expect would be Ecclesiastes, which is a very downer book until you get to the end. It explores all these things that the writer tried and didn't work. And the Song of Solomon, which is this love song, and what's that got to do with God, right? But once they decided that it was like this allegory about God's love for us, then it was accepted into the Old Testament canon. Went through a process of debate. Some debate about Esther because it doesn't use the word God in it anywhere, apparently. And the Israelites then, they had these books, and they were very careful about how they copied them. I'm going to read to you the procedure they used. This is pretty impressive. And this is what they did after they returned from exile into Babylon, as far as we know. And when they were back in Palestine. OK, first, they'd use only clean animal skins to write on and to bind into the manuscripts. Each column of writing could have no less than 48 and no more than 60 lines. The ink must be black and of a special recipe. They must verbalize each word aloud while they were writing it. They must wipe the pen and wash their entire bodies before, before writing the word for God, Jehovah, they say here, every time they wrote it. There must be a review within 30 days. And if as many as three pages required corrections, the entire manuscript was thrown out and had to be redone. Can you imagine? <laughs> Whew, that's an editor. The letters, words, and paragraphs had to be counted. The document became invalid if two letters even touched each other. The middle paragraph, word and letter, must correspond to the original document. The documents could only be stored in sacred places, like synagogues. Talk about fussy. And that's why what we have here is what Moses wrote. <laughs> and Daniel, and Jeremiah, and we can count on it, that it was. Well, how do we know that? Because these manuscripts that we have aren't, aren't that old. 
that in fact, uh, what we do have was discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The oldest manuscript we have is there. This is from caves in the Middle East, a place called Qumran, and a, I don't know if you've heard the story, but a shepherd boy was throwing rocks in this cave and heard a clank, and he went in, there was these pottery, um, and the, in the pottery were these scrolls, and he brought them out, and they were copies of the Bible that had been written somewhere between 150 BC and 70 BC, and now Israel's got these and is making them available. You can actually see them on the internet, the actual scrolls, so that people can study them. All the books of the Hebrew Bible are represented, except Esther. And there are many copies of each book. For example, there's 25 copies of Deuteronomy. All the copies are fragmentary, except the great scroll of Isaiah. That one's complete. And there it is. And this is, this is actually a screenshot from uh, in the internet. And you can go and, if you know how to read Hebrew, you can read the whole Isaiah scroll. It's all there. And you click through it. And here's the cool part. What they discovered is that this scroll is virtually identical to the one that was oldest before this was discovered a thousand years later. Identical. Isn't that cool? So it proves that they were very fussy when they copied their work, these Jewish copyists. Why were they so careful about this? Well, it's kind of a duh. It? It's the word of God. It's sacred work. It was written by prophets of God. And what the prophets said came true. That's how you know it was a prophet of God. The Dead Sea Scrolls include parts of Daniel. Now, this is interesting because Daniel predicted the rise and fall of empires that were hundreds of years later. To detail, to the point where people thought, that that must have been written after the events. It had to do with the kings that came after Alexander and split into the four kingdoms and all this. Daniel predicted that. The Old Testament was written over generations by many different authors, with different kinds of authors, from kings and scribes and shepherds and all sorts of people. It was preserved through hundreds of copies over hundreds of years, yet it speaks with one voice as though it had a single author underneath it all. And that voice, it carries forward the single story of God's relationship with human beings, particularly with the people of Israel. And it talks about trying to make them become the people of God, the kind of people he wants to represent him on the planet. And it was Israel. Then, in the third century, it was translated into Greek. And there's a whole bunch of stories about how that was done with 70 scholars that were hired to go down to Egypt and translate this to be put into the uh, library in Alexandria. It's called the Septuagint. It means 70. And this is the other interesting thing about the Septuagint. The people who were in the New Testament period, all the characters in the New Testament, they didn't use the Hebrew Bible. They used this one, this Greek translation, the Septuagint. When they quote the Bible, they're quoting the Septuagint. And also, um, they referred to some books that we don't have in our Protestant Bible uh, called the Apocrypha. These were books that were written in between our Testament, between the Old and the New Testament, several books in there. And um, the writers of the New Testament refer to those books as well, but they don't quote them. They don't apparently consider them scripture. The, the Jews didn't consider them scripture. In fact, the Jews said that during that time, prophecy had stopped. So. They're not considered the word of God. In fact, they were removed from the Protestant Bibles, but it was relatively recently. They was removed in the 1880s. They, the Apocrypha was in the Bible until the 1880s. 
It's not inspired, but it's useful. It's got the his some more way, some more history of Israel and some more details about things. So what did Jesus think of the Old Testament? We ask that question because it kind of confirms to us what the New Testament is and how important it is, whether it's the Word of God. Jesus said, quoting the Septuagint as God's word, he said, do not think I have come to abolish the law and prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Matthew 5, 17 to 18. Jesus considered this to be the word of God in the Septuagint. Now, why is it so important that we think, that we find out what the writers of the New Testament thought of the Old Testament? Why is that so important? Well, it's important because, as Gene pointed out when I was reading those psalms that were messianic, pointing to Jesus, it's important because those things were centuries before the events happened. And they were fulfilled by Jesus, and in some cases he says we must do this to fulfill all, all prophecy or all righteousness. But some things he didn't have anything to do with, like dividing his clothes under the cross. And those things were fulfilled as well. That's why it's important that we know that, because they wrote that in. Fulfilled prophecy helps us believe the Gospels, you see. The test of a true prophet is that what that prophet says comes true. And the prophecies of the Old Testament came true, so it must be true. Paul says in Romans 15, 4, everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and encouragement of scriptures you might have hope. He's talking about the Old Testament when he says scriptures. Hebrews 1, 1 to 2 connects the Old Testament with the Gospels, saying, in the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days he's spoken to us by his Son. Okay, so now, we can see that the Old Testament has been faithfully copied and that it was accepted by the original people as the Word of God. And we can also see now that the New Testament characters, the writers, considered the Old Testament Old Testament to be God's authoritative word as well. So let's look at the New Testament. What is it? Well, the New Testament didn't drop out of heaven. It didn't appear behind somebody's locked door given to them by angels. It's just a collection of gospels and letters written to specific groups of Christians addressing the issues that they faced. That's all it is. The books describe who Jesus was and develop the religion of Christianity. Jesus told the writers in John 16, 13, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. The truth is compiled into the New Testament in these documents. And it was written by eyewitnesses and written during the lifetime of eyewitnesses. It was written soon after Jesus' resurrection, between 45 and 75 AD, all these documents were written. And Peter, he claims they didn't make up these stories. He says in 2 Peter 1.16, we didn't follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty, he says. Now, why is that important, to be eyewitnesses? Why is it important that it was written so soon after Jesus' resurrection? Well, if the stories were invented by these writers, Everybody would know it's fake. Christianity would never got off the ground. <coughs> Instead, they knew it was real. It had been, the events of Jesus had been witnessed by hundreds of people. As Paul said of Jesus' resurrection, 
in 1 Corinthians 15, 16. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. If the writers themselves knew their stories were fake, would they be submitted to torturous death instead of recanting and say, all right, all right, all right, they're fake, we made them up? No, they would not. I mean, it's absurd to, think that, to even make that argument. Maybe one crazy person would say, okay, I've, I've built my whole life and religion on this fake thing that I knew was fake and I've talked myself into it. Of course, go ahead and kill me for it. But 12 guys? Maybe more? I mean, how many people were, were murdered by the Roman Empire because of their belief? I don't know. If it was fake and they all knew it was fake, it wouldn't have happened. Okay, let's look at the Gospels specifically now. When you read the Gospels, you need to bear in mind that their, their point wasn't the chronology. We're, we're used to thinking of a story and a, and a history as this event and that event and everything kind of chronological according to time. That's not how they're written, although it kind of looks like it. They're written to make a point. So their priority is the message. And you can particularly see that in John where he's, he's taken certain miracles and he's arranged them. He's not writing a chronology, not so much of a history. The events in the Gospels, they appear in different order and have somewhat different details. And not everything that Jesus did is included in these stories. Uh, John said this in John 21, 25, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them was written down, I suppose that even the whole world wouldn't have room for all the books that could be written. If identical, if these books were identical if they were the same, did exactly the same like people seem to wish they were, then you'd have to kind of suspect that these disciples got together and compared their stories and came up with the story they were going to tell. But because they're all kind of different like this, we know there wasn't any collaboration. All right, how about the letters? It's kind of erroneous to call them books because like first, I mean, John, second John and third John, it's little bitty letters. So we call them documents. Well, most of them were written by Paul. Others were written by other disciples or someone writing for an apostle. They addressed particular issues in particular churches and they were circulated among the churches over centuries, really, because they applied to more than just the specific situation that they were originally written to, although it's important to know what they were originally written to to understand what was being said. And you can kind of discern in the letter itself what was going on. But the churches valued them because of how applicable they were to their lives. All right, let's ask, let's ask this question. Which documents then are the word of God? All these letters and gospels, which ones are? Now, there's been some controversy on this, well, for years and years and years and years, but Dan Brown has recently stirred it up. Weren't there just really a whole lot of other Gospels and letters that were rejected? And they were really the truth and not the ones we have? Didn't Constantinople force everybody to accept this bunch because they supported his, his uh, rule? What was the criteria for discovering God's word to us? Notice that the word is discover. God's word. We discovered them. We, we discerned God's word in these documents as they were being used and read. What was the criteria for that? Well, the church used these books for centuries, even though they were written so early. They kept using them. And some came to be used more frequently. People found them more useful. They, they experienced God through some of the books. And those particular books then rose in prominence because people valued them more. And if, if we look back now, you can kind of tell and distill what their criteria seems to have been as they began to select the books that they saw had the word of God in them. And this is interesting. Here's the criteria. 
Nobody sat down and came up with those criteria and then evaluated the books. This was, you can kind of see that this was what they were doing through these centuries. Apostolicity. Was it written by an apostle, or did it have a direct link to an apostle? If so, perhaps it's the word of God. Antiquity. The writing must have come from the age of the apostles, and not later than that. Anything later wasn't considered to be the word of God, even though it was probably useful. Orthodoxy. Did it carry on the teachings of the faith as received, or did it contain novel ideas? Now, we can evaluate a book in our day with the same criteria that we've come up to so far. The Book of Mormon teaches novel ideas. It wasn't written in the apostolic age, and it hasn't been accepted by most of the churches. How about Catholicity? Now, that just means it was kind of universal. Everybody was using it and traditional use. Was it already being used by the majority of the local churches, particularly the most important churches? Apparently, that was Rome, Antioch, and Alexandria. Inspiration. If the book claimed to be inspired, and if it if reading it and understanding it improved people's lives and, and brought them to God in a special way so that the presence of God was in their lives and they were transformed, it was clearly inspired. The selection process of these books was very conservative. So, you know, some of the books that were rejected might have been inspired. It could be that some of these books that Dan Brown or whoever it is talking about are inspired. It could be. But they weren't universally accepted by the churches. And so because they're being very selective and conservative about what they're selecting, and they weren't accepted as the word of God in the canon of the New Testament. All right, now, I said that Constantine wasn't, didn't make this edict and so on, and that's the truth. So how did they actually finally come up and decide? I mean, there's a lot of debate about which, which of these documents should be considered the word of God. There was a lot of people were using all different kinds of things, but certain of them rose in prominence, as I said. And it came about in one particular council in the fourth and fifth century. They, they said, it looks like everybody's using these particular books. And so we're going to say that this particular set of books, set of documents, is the canon of the New Testament. And that was in 397, the Third Council of Carthage in North Africa. It said, OK, we do already have now the canon of the New Testament. And this is already being read and used throughout the church. And it became fixed at that point. Comes to us for, with Greek manuscripts, ancient translations. It, it was translated into other languages. And quotations from other Christian writers that were after the apostolic age. They were quoting scripture. In fact, from what I understand, the whole New Testament could be assembled from all these quotations. That these it was basically preachers, and they were writing down their, their sermons. And of these, we have 5,000 Greek manuscripts. It's an overwhelming number compared to other ancient writings. For example, we have nine or 10 good copies of Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars, his history. It's only nine or 10 copies. Way later than he wrote it, way, way much later. We only have two copies of Livy's Roman history and so on, I could go on. Very few manuscripts. And yet we say, we know the history of Rome. We know that Julius Caesar lived based on these manuscripts. But we have 5,000 Greek manuscripts in the New Testament, many of them much earlier than these other ones. OK, so that's the process by which we have the Bible in the Greek language. We have what was originally written, and we know that. We don't have the original manuscripts. 
But we see how carefully they copied them. So what we have is what was originally written. The religious communities who assembled it thought it was the word of God because of its effect on people. Not just that, but because it was written by a prophet and what the prophet said came true. If we believe all this other ancient history we've been taught, based on its manuscript evidence, we certainly have to say that the great overwhelming abundance of the same kind of evidence assures us that the Bible is at least accurate to what the original documents were. Pretty convincing to me. So when it says it's infallible or inerrant in the original documents, we can say, okay, all right, I get it. What I have is what they wrote. But there is a problem here because there's a heavier burden on the Bible. Because the heavier burden on the Bible is that it's considered the word of God and not just some Roman history. How do we know it's the word of God? How do we know it's inspired? Well, in a couple of weeks, we're going to look at the inspiration of the Bible, but for just now, we're going to say that the Bible is the word of God in the same way our ancient ancestors knew it was the word of God by using the same criteria they used. These people changed, pe this book's changed people's lives just by reading them and understanding them. They bring us to God. I don't know about you, but when I read the Bible, I can sense God speaking to me. In fact, sometimes there's almost a dialogue going on between me and God when I have a problem or I'm thinking about something and I'm reading and it's like, whoa. But a lot of books change people's lives. And, the, and God speaks to us through other books and even works of art. The difference is that these books bring people to God and his salvation. They tell us how to be in a relationship with God. Personal relationship. People can feel the change in themselves and see it happening in others, can see it happening before their very eyes. These books change people for the better. I remember seeing a, a young woman in a church we were some time before. And the first Sunday she came, she is all kind of hard in her eyes and kind of a bitter person. And the next time I saw her, she was peaceful in her eyes. In a week, I said, what happened to you? You, you look so much more peaceful than you did last week. And she says, I accepted Jesus as my Savior. Like, what kind of evidence do I need? Well, today we've seen that the Bible accurately brought down the Word of God through the ages into the ancient Greek language. We haven't brought it into English yet. We're going to bring it into English next week. We'll find out how the Word of God came to sit right there in front of you where you can hold it in your hand. And we trust what we have in English is still as accurate as this Greek manuscripts that we have. That's next week. The week after that, we're going to talk about how do we know it's inspired, the Word of God. Amen. Hope that's helpful. It's been helpful to me to see all that.